here for the Woodbridge Channels. Today, a Yankee story in Woodbridge Township. Identical twins. Why, they played baseball together. They served and fought in Korea together. They played ball for the Army by fudging their baseball experience. They formed the Corona Construction Company together. And they only lived three minutes apart from each other in Colonia. Why, they've only been separated time enough to go on their honeymoons. They played softball for over 30 years together in Woodbridge Township with their children and now their grandchildren. One, a huge Lou Gehrig fan. One, a huge Joe DiMaggio fan. Let's go visit their baseball shrines. Baseball was a game that you could be any size. And we were always not big, we were small. And we just loved the game and we played when I was a child at the Wells Fair in New York. And that's where we started playing ball. And I started to love it. We started playing baseball when we played with the YMCA because the YMCA is the only one that ran baseball. There was no other league like the way the kids play today. My brother and I played like when we were 10, 11, 12 in the YMCA. Then from there we went to the Junior League. From the Junior League, we went into the Senior League. You know, when we were kids, there was no, no Little League. I think if I played Little League, I think I would have been a professional baseball player. <laughs> always together and from the beginning and when we played in the YMCA league no one drove us to the ball field uh, every place we went we had to take a bus 10 15 cents and travel maybe 20 to 25 miles to go to a baseball field and no one ever drove us anywhere when I first started I was I, I was playing first base and our catcher got hurt I was about 15 years old then and we had no catcher. So the coach come up to me and says, does anybody want to go behind the plate? So I says, yeah, I'll go behind the plate. And I went behind the plate at 15 years old, and I've been catching since 15 until I was 32, 32 years old. And I used to catch a lot of double headers. And I was small. I was only about 138 pounds, that's all I was. But I had a good, good throwing arm. That's what made me be a catcher. We, we love playing baseball, but I never owned the glove. And my brother sent me money home from the service to make sure you buy the twins a glove. And I did buy a glove and it was Charlie Keller. Charlie Keller was a right-handed thrower, I think, left-handed hitter. And I always started to follow his life at that time, which I liked him, you know. And I always did. So I still got his picture there. And he was my, he's my favorite outfielder. Uh, uh, Charlie Keller, Hendrick, and DiMaggio was the greatest I've ever seen. My brother and I played for the 10th Field Artillery Battalion. And what happened, after the war, this is 1954, orders came down that they were going to have a baseball team. The 3rd Division was going to have a baseball team. It's going to be a, the 7th Infantry Division, 15th Infantry, the 10th Field Artillery, which my brother and I were in. And we had, a, they had, a, we had tryouts. For us to try out, we had to be like a college player or a semi-pro ball player. At that time, I was 21. I didn't go to college. I just told them that we played semi-pro. Then they took us, and then we tried for the, we tried out for the team, not knowing that the team was all pro ball players. And my brother and I tried out for the team, and we made the team. I'm looking at him, and look, we're playing with with a professional ball players here. You know, I'm saying, what are we doing here? You know, I played the outfield and uh, first base sometimes. We won a lot of we won a lot of games overseas. We played the seventh regiment, the fifteenth regiment, the second infantry division. We just kept on winning. Then we finally got into the into the championship. Wally Hart pitching for us, and he picked me. He wanted me to catch the game. Hank is us, uh, a catcher. He was the smallest catcher I've ever seen, but one of the one of the finest. He had a good arm. The game was going on a lot of strikeouts. I never saw so many strikeouts. Just unbelievable. I mean. Wally and Charlie Bean were throwing that ball like crazy. In the fourth inning, Wally Hart got into trouble, made a couple of errors in the infield. They had a man on second and third. I just didn't know what to do, so I said, we ought to. I went to the mound, I told him, I said, look, just walk this, this next batter. 
He said, this guy's a good hitter. Walk him. The man out there that comes in is the winning run. So I'm not worried about the other two. He says, no, I'm going to pitch to them. So I just didn't know what to say. So I went behind the plate. He struck out the first two batters. The next batter grounded out. The two guys were left on second and third. Okay? In the 12th inning, Lindsay, our second baseman, he hit a double. And the next batter got up and hit a long fly ball to left field. The ball went close to the fence and the outfielder went back. And he leaped up and he caught the ball, but he dropped the ball. And the winning run came in to home plate. And we all started lifting, clapping, and we were so happy. But the umpire said the outfielder caught the ball. Wally and I we were just looking. I said, "Wally, I just can't believe. I just can't believe what ha what happened here. That guy dropped the ball. Everybody saw it. Everybody went hysterical, you know." In the fourteenth inning, Lindsay led off with a walk, stole second, and Charlie Clark got up, singled the left center field, and drove in the winning run, and we won the game. This is the baseball that the guy signed in 1954 that I played with overseas. I got everybody's signature around here. So I made a plaque to put it up here for our team. And of course, this is the trophy we got overseas because, you know, they didn't have many trophies. This came from Japan because we didn't have any trophies. And, you know, after the war, we didn't have too many things, really. about Lou Gehrig, my brothers used to talk about Lou Gehrig. And then when I saw the movie, I was very impressed. I was em emotionally disturbed about his speech, which I have right here in my office right there, is Lou Gehrig's speech, and how he thanked everybody in the stadium at that famous speech. He thanked everybody, and everybody was good to him. So he thought he, that's why he said he was the greatest thing, you know, that ever happened. That's why then I said, I'm going to research his life. And I started it in 1954 when I came home from Korea. I went to the Baseball Hall of Fame and I looked up Lou Gehrig and, and there really wasn't that much on Lou Gehrig. The top floor was all Babe Ruth. I said, there's something missing. There's got to be more about Lou Gehrig. And then as the years went on, I, I started reading how he was overlooked. Uh, Babe Ruth overshadowed him, so did Joe DiMaggio. And then it started when I got the stamp. When the stamp came out of Lou Gehrig, I went back to the Hall of Fame. I've been there about three or four times. And just about every floor had everything on the My father-in-law was a mailman, and he gave me these pictures, the first cut out of the post office and gave it to me as a gift. And when I put it up, I told my father-in-law, you know what? There's going to be a stamp of Lou Gehrig someday. He goes, let's not get out of, out of hand. No way. There it is. The month of June, to me, is dedicated to Lou Gehrig. Born in June, died in June, hit four home runs in June, and started as a Yankee June 1st. Well, the biggest stat about Lou Gehrig that he played 2,130 consecutive games, which nobody can, could beat. And I always said it's going to be broken someday. His stats hitting four home runs in one game, no one's ever done that. In fact, the fifth home run, he missed it by inches in the same game. And he's drove in 150 runs seven times. He holds the most hits by any Yankee ever hit, 2,700, over 2,700 hits. He holds the record over 534 doubles that no one in the Yankees has done. It was 1934. Uh, he won everything. He won the Triple Crown, but lost the most valuable player, which was totally wrong. It was Mickey Cochran that won the most valuable player. But the records he made that year is unbelievable. He should have won it. If he would have lived four more years, I think he would have had close to 3,000 hits, over 3,000 hits. And he would have had close, maybe not beating Babe Ruth's record, but I would say close, maybe 685, something like that. He would have done. I think he's the greatest ball player that I'll ever lived next to Babe Ruth. The first piece of Mirror Mirror is in the other room, um, which my daughter had redone. It's the first picture I ever put up of Lou Gehrig, and it's in the corner. The picture on the door was stationed in a restaurant in New York, and it fell off of something, 
and then we're going to throw it away. And my son says, no, don't throw that away. I want to take it home. So he came home with it on a train, and uh, it was very funny because it's so big. But that's where I got the picture. He saved it for me. My wife was thrilled to death. <laughs> Well, I started the first collecting old pictures, even when I, I lived in New York. I have I got a tremendous amount of pictures. I couldn't take them all to Jersey. But then when I started my little Garrick room, then he started the, the work on Joe DiMaggio room, which he, he's been collecting pictures. And then his sons have been giving him pictures and frames. And, and he started his room. He's got quite a bit. My first experience with Joe DiMaggio was when I went to Yankee Stadium when I was about 14, 15 years old and I saw Joe DiMaggio up on the field saying, look, I'm looking at one of the greatest players and I got a big thrill over that just by looking at him. Well, I like Joe DiMaggio because he was just a natural player. He didn't, whatever he did, he did it perfect. Like Yogi Berra said, he never made a mistake. And I thought that was tremendous when he said that. But he was one of the best base runners in baseball. He could get a, a single and stretch it into a double. He knew where the ball was hit, and if he, he knew right away if that he could make that stretch around first, he could make it second. He did that so many times. He made a single into a double. I'll be very honest with you, DiMaggio never, never struck out standing, or Ted Williams, or Garrick. If they struck out, they struck out swinging. But if you're watching the game, and you're looking at Joe Dia in center field, he, he didn't move. As long as you heard the crack of the bat, the crack of the bat, he knew exactly where to go. Either he went to the left or he went to the right. He didn't go in and then all of a sudden he went out to deep center field. And he knew exactly where to throw the ball. Like Ruiz Zudo said, he always threw the ball to me, it was right on the nose. Right on target. If there was a fly ball to the outfield and it was two outs, the infield would be in the dugout already. Because they knew that he would catch the ball. But that, that was true. I like this. Here is the, the picture with uh, Joe DiMaggio when he first came up. Of course, Lou Gehrig was still playing, and he was his idol. And uh, I have a picture here of Joe D and, uh, and Lou Gehrig kneeling next to each other. I thought that was a great picture. Right now, my favorite player is Derek Cheetah because he plays like DiMaggio. He knows how to play. He doesn't make many mistakes. And that's how Joe was. And I also like Bernie Williams. Uh, because he was like a, he was like the Maggio. Well, this is my brother and I when we were playing in the Summer Boat League, and it was just me and him, and there was nothing in the background. My son got this picture, and he put Babe Ruth, a picture of Babe Ruth, and a picture of Lou Gehrig behind him, a picture of Babe, a Babe Ruth behind me. He didn't have the Maggio, so he got Babe Ruth. That's okay. And then he put this camouflage and now every place we go that when we used to play Ruth and Lou Gehrig used to come and watch us play and everybody says watch us play he says yeah they used to come down to the field after the game and see us play and everybody believed us and they said where did you get that I said well we took a picture and of Ruth and Gehrig behind us and that was it I came back from Korea um, my, my brother and I would play Samurai Pro Ball for about 14, 15 years, probably for a long time. And then from there, when we got married, we moved to New Jersey. And then after we stopped playing baseball, we stopped playing softball. Uh, we played for Corona, which is our construction company. And we've been with Corona since, I don't remember what year it was. You remember what year when we first started, 1962? We started the Corona in 1954. We played in the softball league almost 35 years. We're still in the softball league at Woodbridge. We're still there because it's the greatest sport in the world. There's no other sport other than baseball. Babe Ruth said that. Right? I'd say the same thing. We love baseball. I just, I just love the game. I love the sound of the bat when you hit the ball. I know everything about the ball. It's got 108 stitches. They keep asking me, how do you know that? It, it weighs five ounces and three inches in diameter. 
home plate to second base, 127 feet, two and three eight inches. They say, I, I, don't, I, I can't believe you know all this. I know the size of the batter's box, the coach's box. Si I know all that stuff, you know. None of these kids don't talk about that. I, I want to show everybody how Joe DiMaggio played the outfield. A lot of people don't know, but I know. This is how he used to stand, with his foot forward all the time. Just waiting for the ball to be pitched. Love on the floor. Took that in. Let it match. Smoked it. Walked around. Then the pitcher threw the ball, and the pitcher just said, Joe! <laughs> well, we want to thank the Palumbo brothers for sharing their wonderful, interesting story with us. For the Woodbridge Channels, we'll catch you next time. Get it? Catch you? Baseball? <laughs>